Please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 24 to 37 as we wrap up the uh, seventh chapter of the book of Mark. Um, if you do have an outline, it may be helpful to follow along. You can find that in YouTube comments or on our website. Um, it's in the bulletin. The last page of the bulletin is the outline for today's uh, sermon. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse number 24. The word of God says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast a demon out of her. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought him to a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would illuminate this text to us, that as we look back into history about 2,000 years ago, it would be relevant for our times. We pray, Lord, for any prayer requests that came in this morning, such as our brother Ed, whose back is hurting him, that during this time you would provide relief for him, that he might be able to join us in worship and hearing the word without being distracted by the pain. We pray for our nation, which is in so much hurt right now and chaos running amok. We pray that there would be peace, Lord, a peace that comes not from anything other than the gospel. Help us, Lord, as your people to hear the word and to apply it to our lives for the sake and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible declares that God is no respecter of persons. In God, we find there is no partiality. Everyone stands before God as mere sinful human beings. No amount of money can buy him. No social class can persuade him. And no achievement can impress him. God is fair. God is just. But what about us? Can we say the same for us? Whether believer or non-believer, generally speaking, are human beings impartial, unbiased? I don't know about you, but I think 2020 will go down in history as proof that we've not yet arrived. We live in perhaps a, the most polarized time in our society's history. Conservative versus liberal, police versus protesters, white versus black. I am not, of course, suggesting that this polarization is true in every member of every group I just mentioned. But if you've been following the news lately, our nation is burning. There's an image that I'm sure most of us have seen over the last week that we probably cannot get out of our heads, that of George Floyd being uh, choked, basically under the knee of a police officer. Combine that with images of businesses burning, people looting and rioting, it goes to show the extent to which our depravity will take us. 
people are hurting, people are scared, and people are being killed. And who's to blame for stoking the flames of division? As I ask that question, things probably come to your mind, depending on who you listen to and who you read. Who's stoking these flames? And you've seen and I've seen everybody blamed for this, including the president, white supremacists, the media, Antifa, radical leftists, capitalism, liberalism, critical race theory, the police, and so on. But there may be some truth in some of those suggestions, as maybe some of those things are indeed feeding the fire. But in order to put the fire out, we need to know what caused the fire. And regardless of what you may think is the political or ideological reason behind all of this, one thing is for sure. Sin is the root cause. Depravity creates division. And if this is true, then as much as we may pursue a certain theory or a certain policy or hope for good leadership, those things will only be band-aids to put over a mortal wound. We need a cure. The truth is, only the gospel of Jesus Christ can extinguish the flames of division. Now, we say amen to this, but where does that end? If that were so, if it were so simple to simply say the gospel puts an end to it, then why does the Apostle James tell his readers to show no partiality? Why did the Apostle Paul tell the Ephesians to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, to esteem others better than themselves, to bear with one another, and for the strong to bear with the weak? If simply saying the gospel is the cure, do we snap our fingers and pursue impartiality? It's not as easy as saying the gospel is the solution and everything solves itself any more than declaring to someone, be warm and filled, will send them away warm and filled. Even God's people, blood-bought, Bible-believing, born-again Christians, struggle with the sins of partiality, ethnocentrism, racism, prejudice, even personality, and the like. This is not to suggest at all that the gospel isn't powerful, any more to say that being a Christian doesn't mean that you won't still struggle with anger or lust or pride or apathy. And I'm saying this intentionally because there seems to be a stream within our own circles that refuses to talk about racism and prejudice other than to say, just preach the gospel. Now, we don't do that with other sins, do we? We don't do that with abortion. We don't do that with pornography. You can list many sins. We don't just, just preach the gospel. We try to fight the sin head on. These cliches that we come up with, it's not a skin problem. It's a sin problem. Do we say to those who would try to fight against abortion, it's not a life problem. It's a strife problem. You're wasting your time. We wouldn't do that. Do not be blind, my brothers and sisters, to the fact that many of us still struggle with partiality because it is our sinful nature. And we're seeing the ill effects of depravity playing out in front of our eyes and people need answers. They will look to politicians. They will look to ideologies. They will look for all sorts of solutions, but we must get them to look to Christ. They will look to riots and looting. But the answer is found in Jesus. And the church needs to speak on this issue precisely, precisely because the church can speak to this issue. And why? Why can we speak to this issue? Because we have a message that levels the field. We have a message that is good news to everyone. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And here in the gospel of Mark, Jesus comes on the scene to inaugurate his kingdom and take down the kingdoms of man, the divisive, 
partial, prejudiced kingdoms of man. You saw this last time when we were in the book of Mark in the first half of the chapter of chapter seven. We saw the Pharisees create this sort of us versus them mentality. And that wasn't even between ethnicities. That was Jew versus Jew, leader versus those under their feet, clean and unclean. Hand washing versus no hand washing. And what does Jesus do to this sort of partiality? He levels the field. He brings them face to face with the reality of the human heart. And he says it is from the human heart that wickedness comes. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Pharisee who keeps every extent of the law or a disciple of Jesus who doesn't wash properly before eating. All have sinned. All have depravity in their hearts. He levels the field. You see, the Pharisees looked down on others because they thought so highly of themselves. They, after all, were God's chosen people. They were the keepers of the law. They were the leaders. Jesus rocked their world. And now that he's rebuked their pride, he moves on. And he goes somewhere they may never expect him to go. He's already been scandalous, right? He's already done things on the Sabbath, and he's, he's healed people that were unclean. And every episode in the book of Mark is meant to show a scandal for that first century audience. And here comes yet another scandal. And what is it? It's Jesus entering into Gentile territory. Let us look at this account and see how Jesus' interaction with outcasts, outsiders, teaches us about the diversity of God's kingdom and informs our attitudes toward those who are different. Jesus' ministry impacts outsiders. At, uh, many commentators at this point in our text, they, they divide Mark, say that the first part up, up to this part in chapter 7 is the ministry to the Jews in Galilee, and now it's his first and only ministry here in Gentile territory. Now, there were Gentiles in chapter 3, uh, in the great crowds, chapter 3, verse 8. There were actually people from this very region of Tyre. But this is the first time that Jesus is entering into Gentile territory. You can find a parallel passage in Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28. Let's look at Jesus entering into Gentile territory in verse 24 of our text today. It says, and from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. Now, our previous message, Jesus does the proverbial mic drop about the heart, and now he's continuing in his mission. Nothing in Jesus' mission is incidental. And for what purpose? Well, it says here he, he was looking to get away, but he couldn't be hidden. Uh, people have proposed different ideas about this. This was maybe a respite where he and his disciples can go. He can teach them away from the crowds. Uh, he had a desire to remain hidden so people wouldn't follow him just because of miracles. There are speculations that abound as to why Jesus would want to take a break, especially in a region like Tyre and Sidon. Calvin combines all of them, and he, he says basically that Jesus, who is indeed um, fully human and fully divine, desired to rest with his disciples but just for a time being, but because he is sovereign and compassionate, he still had his mission in mind. In other words, when the Gentiles would come up to him during this time, it wasn't a surprise to our sovereign Lord that there would be people asking him for miracles. He knew exactly what he was doing. But it also points us to a greater reality, and that being the opening up of the blessings of the gospel to the Gentile. In Psalm 87, verses 1 through 4, Listen to what the word of God says. It says, on the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God, Selah. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that one day even the Gentiles would know the Lord. And what you see in front of you this morning is the first step toward that. Hallelujah. Now, as Jesus could not be hidden, he's in this house desiring some rest. Here comes this Gentile woman, and she has a request. She begs Jesus to help her child. Look at verse 25 and 26. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, 
and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now there's another account in Matthew. We'll focus primarily on what Mark says because we're preaching through the book of Mark, but some of what Matthew says informs this context as well. Matthew identifies her as a Canaanite. She is from Syrophoenicia. She's from the land of the Canaanites. And just imagine for a moment, if you were one of the first readers of the book of Mark or the first hearers of the book of Mark, and you heard that there was a Canaanite woman that Jesus would minister to, right? To, to us, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you knew what the Canaanites did historically with Israel, these were enemies of God. These were pagan savages for all Israel was concerned with. And Jesus is ministering to her. She approaches Jesus. Mark doesn't mention that Matthew says that Jesus says, I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mark's uh, goal here is to highlight Jesus' interaction with Gentiles. But the scandal of this story doesn't strike us like it would the original audience. It's not just that she's a Gentile. It's also that she's a woman. And it's also that the person she wants to heal is her daughter. You see, we're talking about a time where there wasn't the, the sort of equality we have now. And so she, her, her ethnicity holds her back. Her gender holds her back. But what does she continue to do? She continues to ask Jesus for this miracle. The ESV uses the word begs. Other versions says, keep, say, keep asking. The, the fact is she was persistent. And she was so persistent that the disciples in Matthew's account say to Jesus, send her away because she's, she's crying after us. There, there's an image there that this woman is rather annoying. She's annoying. She's persistently asking over and over if she can have Jesus' attention to heal her daughter who had a demon. And the disciples want her gone. This brings up so many um, anecdotal instances, right, of, of being ignored. Don't you hate being ignored? Or maybe you've ignored others. You become so wrapped up in yourself that you don't hear the pleas of the desperate. Or perhaps you've been asking and asking yourself, but there seems to be no answer. And to make it worse, the disciples are telling him, let her go. But Jesus is marked by compassion. So we know that he has a purpose in this, just as he did when he was in the boat and fell asleep in a storm. This isn't purposeless. He sees her desperation and he answers. And he has a very intriguing interaction, which then leads to a miracle. Look at verse 27 to 30. And he said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And when she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So he finally answers her. We don't know how, how many times she asked the question, but finally he answers her. But even his interaction is kind of puzzling, isn't it? What is this thing he's saying to her about dogs? Remember that Jesus is the master teacher. Just as it was puzzling that he would sleep in a boat when his disciples were running around in the midst of a storm, wondering if they would die. We know he had a purpose in that. He has a purpose in the way he interacts with this woman. I believe that here he is conjuring up the faith of this woman for everyone there to see. Now, what Jesus says strikes us, right? If the other things about her being a Gentile and a Canaanite don't really strike us as uh, scandalous because of the time in which we live, certainly referring to a woman as a dog would be a scandal. But what Jesus says isn't meant to be insulting. The fact is Gentiles were seen as dogs. They were seen as outsiders in that society by the Jews. But many commentators point out that the word that's used here for dog is house pet. And it's not just the word, you can tell by the context, right? Scavenger dogs outside, the, the mangy dogs outside wouldn't necessarily be let in to be at the, the table side of the children as they ate their food. But a house pet would. Um, so she, he's not necessarily calling her a dog in that sense. Even so, he's making a comparison. Namely, that Jesus' ministry is primarily to the Jews. The children in this illustration 
who are sitting to eat bread are the children of God, Israel, the Jews. Matthew, as I said earlier, records him saying, I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So as a Gentile, she has no more right to lay claim to Jesus' power than a house dog has the right to claim the first serving of food before the children are served. Now, just to address the issue of being called a dog, I like what Derek Thomas says. He mentions also the commentators who say it's not a scavenger dog, it's a house pet. And he says this, well, that may be true, but you know, if you refer to a woman and call her by the name of a household pet, you're still not going to make any great favors. However you interpret this, this is a harsh statement. This is a difficult statement, and we need to let it stand as it is. But here's the remarkable thing about how this woman processes such a difficult statement. She's not insulted. She doesn't fight back. She doesn't argue. And she doesn't give up. She doesn't insist on her rights. She says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. She recognizes her position in the economy of salvation. She knows that she's not entitled to Jesus' power. And her only argument is that even the dogs can eat the crumbs. So please give me a crumb. Now, how vast is the difference between her and the Pharisees from previous narratives. Those Pharisees, they had a sense of privilege, a sense of entitlement. And Jesus absolutely tore into them and exposed the wickedness of their hearts. But this woman knew that she was a dog. She knew that she wasn't entitled to anything. She knew that she was a mere beggar. But she also knew that Jesus was merciful. In the first century Hellenistic world, there were many faith healers, many miracle workers floating around. William Lane says the power of God is properly released, not in a context of superstition and magic, but in response to faith. The irony of Jesus' comparison is intended to invite a renewed appeal. It's as though Jesus is distancing himself from all the, the fake miracle workers out there and, and really saying, do you really want my power? Do you understand that you cannot conjure it up by superstition? You cannot just get it because you asked for it. You cannot lay hold that, that you're entitled to it. It can only be given by grace. And you must first see yourself as she sees herself, as a beggar. In the book of Matthew, he tells us that Jesus announced that this woman had great faith. And Mark here tells us that this statement demonstrates her faith. And as a result, what does Jesus do? He grants her request. He heals her daughter. This is the attitude that Mark highlights as the right attitude. Again, this, it's not incidental. This story happens after the story with the Pharisees. The Pharisees had it all covered, right? Every eye dotted, every T crossed, every hand washed. Jesus says, your hearts are wicked. But here's a woman, a Gentile woman, a beggar, coming to Jesus as a beggar. But because she understood that she was a beggar, Mark highlights her, elevates her, and says, she's the one whose faith you should emulate. It's as if she's saying to Jesus, if I, Lord, if you, Lord, say that I am a dog, then so be it. Even dogs get crumbs. And they eat at the same time with the crumbs. So there's no interruption of your meal. Please let me have some crumbs. Derek Thomas calls her the New Testament version of Jacob, the one who would lay hold of God and say, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so what happens when she gets home? Her faith turns to sight. This is such an amazing thing. She gets home and her daughter is healed. The demon has been cast away. Notice something about this. She requested crumbs, but she doesn't get mere crumbs, does she? There's nothing second class about the miracle Jesus does for her. Nothing whatsoever. 
It's the same type of miracle that Jesus has done for all the Jewish people that he's cast demons out of, that he's healed, that he's caused to see and hear. She doesn't get mere crumbs. She gets the good bread. She gets the same treatment. Think about that. Back in the Galilean region, the Jewish Pharisees are eating the just desserts of humble pie, while this Gentile woman in Tyre receives a fresh baked piece of warm, delicious bread from the master. This levels the field. She comes to him as a beggar. He answers her request. What an amazing story and what a contrast to the previous message. Her answer, yes, Lord. The beggar knew who she was, and that humility is what brought her to Jesus, and Jesus did not turn her away. It doesn't matter that she's a Gentile woman. She took God at his word. She believed truth about herself because she believed the truth that Jesus spoke to her. This is the faith that saves. Now, after this amazing miracle where he literally says, your daughter has been made whole, the demon has left her, she goes home and finds that to be true. Jesus then moves on. Look at verse 31 and 32. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. Now, Mark doesn't indicate exactly where this happened. If you know the map of Israel at the time, uh, Decapolis just simply means 10 cities. So it's, it's a very large region. Um, the they that come to Jesus could be Jews. There were some uh, synagogues and Jewish communities in Decapolis. They could be Gentiles. Um, based upon what we, what we know about the region, it's most likely another group of Gentiles or at the very least a mixed crowd. The cities of the Decapolis were very Hellenized and often considered pagan by the Jews. So I think this is another attempt that Mark is giving us to show us the expansion of the kingdom as it moves into primarily Gentile territory. And there's another contrast here because our earlier narrative, the one with the Pharisees, remember they, they demanded ritual washing to rid themselves of the uncleanness. And, and the primary cause of their uncleanness was going to the marketplace where there were Gentiles. So here Jesus goes into a crowd likely consisting of Gentiles and those very Gentiles lay hands on him. He gets very physical with them. He doesn't uh, say unclean and have a Pharisaic attitude. So what happens in this story as they, as they bring this man? And notice in verse 32, they beg him, right? There's that word again for continual ask. We find again, these people coming to Jesus with a spirit of, of begging, of begging, helplessness and desperation. Jesus, who has done all things well, performs another miracle here. Look at verse 33 to 37. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. The more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, in this story, Mark doesn't record a conversation like he does with the Syrophoenician woman, but he once again does highlight the persistent nature of the request. They begged him to lay hands on him, and Jesus responds to this begging. In verse 33, he takes the man aside privately. He touches his ears. He touches his tongue. He says, Aphatha, which is Aramaic for be opened, and the man's deafness and his speech impediment leave instantly, just as the demon left the girl. But notice in this that the highlight, I think, is Jesus' personal touch. He's not concerned, like I said, about ritual uncleanness and man-made rules. William Hendrickson suggests that Jesus putting his fingers in the man's ears was a way to communicate with someone that doesn't communicate well. He's communicating to him something will be done to your ears and I will do it. And likewise, when he touches the man's tongue, it's like he's saying to him in, 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 in sort of a nonverbal way, something will be done to your tongue and I will do it. What a beautiful picture of God entering in to the plight of man. 
Calvin comments that when Jesus sighs before he, he, he says, be opened, was a way for the man's sorrows to become Jesus' sorrows. It is clear that in this moment, Jesus is identifying with the man. So if this truly is a Gentile man, you have another amazing story of how the gospel is impacting those who are seen as outsiders. Now, whereas in the previous episode, Jesus simply spoke the word, and from a distance, he said, your daughter has been made whole. In this instance, Jesus gets up close and personal and touches the man till he's made whole. There's no contradiction in this, of course. Jesus, the divine son of God, is capable of both performing miracles by his word from a distance and drawing close to those who draw close to him. Now, after doing this amazing miracle, Jesus tells the crowd to keep quiet. And yet, as we've seen before, the crowd does not obey. They more zealously praise him instead. They cannot contain their excitement, which of course is beautiful, but at the same time, we shouldn't condone their disobedience. Uh, perhaps Jesus doesn't want people to follow him um, just because of the miracles. Jesus is single-minded in mission. He didn't want to be confused with those uh, Hellenistic miracle workers. His mission went beyond miracles. And there were times as a, as a human being, he needed rest. So there are many reasons why Jesus would say, don't tell about this. But whatever the case, these people proclaim, he has done all things well. And indeed he has. What a preview right here in this story of the one day choir up in heaven consisting of men and women from every tribe and tongue and nation singing glory to the Lamb of God. Here we have Gentiles praising the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 35 is a, is a preview of this. In verse 2 of Isaiah 35, the prophet speaks of the glory of Lebanon, which of course is in the same region of Tyre. And then listen to verses 4 through 6. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Our Savior does all things well. And his kingdom, and his gospel, is to go forth to everyone, Jew or Gentile. For with God, there is no partiality. Now, how does that apply to us today. You see in your outline, the application is that the power of Christ's kingdom reaches everyone who begs for mercy. The power of Christ's kingdom reaches everyone who begs for mercy. Now, I shouldn't have to, but maybe I should qualify what I mean by that. I don't mean that a random person who simply says, have mercy will receive mercy. Uh, it's not a magic formula that you just say. But everyone who truly understands his or her need as a beggar because they understand their own sinfulness and God's holiness and they come to Christ because they recognize he and he alone has the power to save their soul isn't going to be turned away because of their race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or whatnot. That's what I mean when I say that everyone who begs for mercy will find mercy. Remember that the Apostle Paul says the gospel is the power of God and salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, at the beginning of this sermon, I mentioned that there is a problem of all sorts of division, polarization, partiality, and things like that in our world today. It is a sinful condition of prideful human beings. That's what it is. And it's playing out before our very eyes. Well, how? then do we come to a point where we can honor the Lord by being impartial, honor the Lord by loving all people, honor the Lord by living out the very message that we preach. To have a proper view of self and others, we must turn not to psychology, not to sociology, 
but to the gospel. And that's why a story like this from 2,000 years ago is as relevant today than ever. So I ask you three questions. One, do you see yourself as a beggar? Two, do you see other beggars like you? And three, do you see Jesus Christ as the only one who can satisfy your needs? When Martin Luther died, it's been reported that there was a note found near his bedside table. And apparently this note had the expression, we are beggars all, this is true. Now, as someone who appreciates church history, or really anybody who, who loves the gospel and loves the teachings of justification by faith, we think of Martin Luther as this world-shaking reformer. We think of him as, as the proto-Christian celebrity. We think of him as a towering figure, someone who translated the Bible into German, and I think it was about a month, right? But what did Martin Luther, according to this, this note that was found, think of himself? He thought of his, himself as a beggar. We are beggars all. This is true. This is the point we need to get to in our lives to keep our prides in check. Mark presents two sets of people in chapter 7. Those who are self-righteous and those who are needy. Now, the fact is, both of them are needy, but the difference is one sees themselves as needy, and the other refuse to see themselves as needy. And in Mark 7, the people who are elevated, the people who are put forward to the reader as those whose faith we should emulate, are not the people the first century audience would expect. They are the outcasts, the Gentiles, a woman, a deaf man with a speech impediment. So with whom do you identify? It's not the ethnicity that matters. It's not the ability that matters. It's the heart's disposition. This coming off the heels of Jesus teaching about the human heart. Those who came to Jesus with humble hearts, begging him to have mercy, found mercy. Those who came to criticize Jesus and bind heavy burdens on those they deem less than them, and thought of themselves as deserving and entitled to God's grace, they found condemnation. I ask you the question, especially if you're listening and you haven't laid hold of Christ by faith. If you're outside of the faith, it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, what occupation you have, how many achievements you have made in your lifetime. You are a sinner just like me. And you have transgressed the law of a holy God, and you will stand before God in judgment one day. And the solution to solving that, that issue between you and God, the need for reconciliation with your creator, is not going to be found in any of the things this world has to offer. Any theory, any philosophy, any policy, will only be found in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark is driving this point home today for us, that it's Jesus and Jesus alone who can make you right with God. And so I ask, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as entitled? You know, oftentimes Christians get a bad rap, especially when we say we know we have a home in heaven. I know that God's my father. I know that I'm born again. And then how dare you say that? How dare you presume? And why do they say that? It's because the world doesn't understand that we recognize that our salvation is by grace. If heaven were achieved by being good, none of us would be there. And if heaven were achieved by being good, and you said, I know I'm going to heaven, then that is boasting because you're boasting in goodness. But if you understand that you don't deserve heaven, you only deserve God's just wrath and condemnation, it reduces you to nothing more than a beggar, and you must plead for mercy, and by the grace of God, he will give it to you. This reminds me of the story of Mephibosheth. Back in the Old Testament, Jonathan's son, David the king, and Jonathan had a wonderful friendship. Jonathan had died, and the king wanted to bless the household of Jonathan, and who was there but Mephibosheth, this, this man who um, was crippled. 
He would have been an outsider, an outcast in Israel in those days. And the Bible tells us that he came to sit at the king's table and he ate the food of the king. He wasn't sitting at like another table where he can have crumbs. He was invited to sit with the king. That is our salvation. We sing the song, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. All of us, apart from God, are strangers and aliens to the promises of God until by repentance and faith in Christ, we are brought near to God. So understand this. Jesus Christ made atonement. He shed his blood for your pride, for your prejudice, for your partiality. And if you would turn from your sin and believe on Christ who rose from the grave the third day, you will be saved and you will be brought in to a people, very tribe and tongue and nation. Do you see yourself as a beggar? And I would add, brothers and sisters, that gospel presentation isn't a time for you to tune out and say, okay, now, now the pastor's talking to the unbeliever here. This is for all of us because we still have um, sin that lurks around in the dark corners of our hearts. We've established that last time in the book of Mark. And one of the, the, the chiefest sin is pride and arrogance and so on and so forth, right? And so you and I need to be constantly reminded, not only of the promises of God in Christ, but also of the reality that our pride is an affront to God. And we must be brought back to the idea that we are beggars. And when you see yourself as a beggar, it really colors how you see everybody else. And that brings us to this next point. Do you see other beggars like you? It, it's, there's this famous quote, and it's hard to attribute to the, the first person to say this, but you've, I'm sure you've heard it. It's been said that evangelism is one beggar telling other beggars where to find bread, where to find bread. You know, if you don't see yourself as a beggar, you will inevitably look down on others. But when you see yourself as a beggar, you will find more identity with the people around you. Think about that Syrophoenician woman. Warren Wiersbe points out that everything was against her. Her nationality was against her. Her gender was against her. Satan himself was against her. Jesus' disciples were against her. She was a Canaanite woman. Her ancestors, savage pagans, enemies of God's people, but she knew she was a beggar, cried out for mercy, and Jesus healed her daughter. We must see ourselves as beggars. Thomas Lai says, the man that is most busy in censuring others is always least employed in examining himself. It starts with examining oneself. And then when we come to the gospel, as Ken Hughes says, the ground level is at the foot of the cross. When we stand there together, looking at Jesus together, you recognize that there is no male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, for all are one in Christ Jesus. But let me be blunt. The tragedy in our society today is that we have a gospel for all nations, a church for all nations, and God's revealed will that his redeemed in heaven consists of all nations. But when we talk about all nations, we tend to get a little nervous, don't we? Sometimes we still harbor partiality against those people. It's become disgusting to me when people claiming to be Christians lament the diversification of this nation. Over the years, I've heard people say things like, this is America, I will not press one for English. I've heard people lament the fact that in a few decades, whites might be the minority. I've heard people say Muslims shouldn't be allowed to run for office. And these are all statements coming from Christians. Something recently online I saw Dehumanizing people from Somalia, from Christians. I see a resurgence of people claiming that American slavery wasn't an immoral institution in and of itself. 
from Christians. And brethren, I've seen this stuff over the past two decades from people in my own circles, in our circles, not open heretics, people who otherwise would be concerned with sound doctrine, biblical fidelity, faithful ministry, zeal for evangelism, fervent in prayer, but a huge blind spot to their own ethnocentrism. As a Christian living in America today, you and I literally have the nations coming to our doorstep and your biggest concern is how they might change your precious culture? Brethren, lay down the idols of your culture. Don't be afraid to sympathize with minority persons who feel undervalued. We hear stories of people brothers in Christ, expressing their own timidity about going outside, about what's going to happen to their children if they get pulled over by cops. And what are you going to do? Come around them, put an arm around them and say, now, brother, you just bought into critical race theory. Let me show you some videos from Prager University. I mean, seriously. People are being killed, and you and I have a message that transforms, and we're afraid to talk about racism because some guy who has appointed himself to keep the gates and has a blog or YouTube channel might call you a liberal. Enough with that. The gospel is the answer because sin is the problem. The answer will not be socialism, but it also will not be appointing pro-life judges to the Supreme Court. The answer will not be critical race theory, but it also will not be capitalism or libertarianism. The answer will be the gospel. But it's also how God's people live out the gospel they confess. Will those people who confess the glories of Jesus Christ show partiality? Will they show prejudice? Will they defend racist institutions? My brothers and sisters, if we see ourselves as nothing but mere beggars and see others as beggars in need of food, then it won't matter where they come from, would it? It won't matter what they look like, will it? It won't matter how much they make. When you see yourself as a beggar, you have no time to judge other people. May God's people lead the way in demonstrating love for all nations. It starts with abandoning your pride and seeing yourself as a beggar. If we establish these truths, I'm a beggar. The people around me are beggars, whether they know it or not. If they don't know it, we preach to them so they may repent. We establish that we're beggars. Where does that lead us? If we just end the message right now, it's like we've, we've left on this, this hook, right? Well, now what? Well, what is Mark pointing us to in this chapter? That the solution to our begging is only satisfied in Christ. Do you see Christ as the only one who can satisfy your needs? As I look at the news stories, as I see the sorrow of business owners who are losing their businesses due to the riots and the looting, as I think of the family of the Arberries and the Floyds, think about the cops who are, uh, people are generalizing about them. I, I just think about all of these, these people who are suffering at this division in our country. And all they need, what they need is Christ. We need to point them to Christ. What does this say about Jesus? He is the word of God who cuts to the heart, but he's also the great shepherd who cares for his people. And what does it say about us? That if we boast, if we boast about our own righteousness, we will reveal that our hearts are far from God. But if we approach Christ as beggars, we find that his heart is close to us. Mark chapter 7 opens up the gospel to Gentiles. 
And Jesus shows no partiality. He goes to the outsiders and everyone who comes to him, he will not cast out. Jesus levels the playing field. He alone satisfies our hunger. He alone can forgive us of our sins. He alone cares for us perfectly. And that's why when we see a burning world, we say, come, Lord Jesus. There's a lot of talk about reconciliation among the races, but you know this very well. There can be no reconciliation amongst each other until we are reconciled to God. So let us start with the gospel, but let us understand that even people who hold to the gospel have once held humans as slaves. There are blind spots. There are things that you harbor in your heart, whether it be pride or apathy, even though you confess the gospel. So it starts with the gospel, but it also means to live humbly, to understand the mercy you've been given, to love your neighbor, and tell other beggars where to find the bread of life. And then when the nations start coming to Christ, we will see that choir continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we will see in that choir people who've been saved out of rioting and looting. We'll see mayors, hopefully. We'll see governors, hopefully. We'll see cops. We'll see people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And we will say together with them, Jesus does all things well. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you are a God who uh, does not show partiality. We thank you, Lord, that salvation is by grace through faith. We pray that you would help us as your people to uh, speak truth to this world and focus on the gospel, but also that we would root out any prejudice, any racism, any um, partiality that still remains in our hearts and be open and honest about these things that we may honor you more and more. Father, thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. And we ask you bless the preaching of your word in Jesus name. Amen.